remember uh, two years ago, Mumbai, city's maximum city, was the subject of a devastating terrorist attack that ended up with the death toll of 166 people. For three days, the world watched in dismay. It's India's biggest city with a population of 16 million, Temple Hall and was held hostage by no more than a dozen Pakistani young men in jeans and designer t-shirts. Some people, including Senator John McCain and General David Petraeus, referred to this as India's 9-11. Revealing this generated a strong reaction in India, with many intellectuals rejecting this partner and arguing that this was not the case at all. One reason they said this is because far from being a new development, 2611, as the Mumbai attack has come to be known, was only the most visible uh, in a long list of such attacks. In fact, and some of you may not know this, Mumbai now has the dubious distinction of being the most attacked city in the world. Um, on 12 March 1993, 15 almost simultaneous explosion kills 257 people and left more than 1,000 injured. In August 2003, 46 people were killed in two bomb explosions in public places. In July 2006, several bombs exploded in suburban trains there, killing some 200 and injuring 700. Mumbai has not only been, has not been the only Indian city targeted by jihad, so had New Delhi, Bangalore, Hyderabad, and Jaipur, among others. In fact, between January 2004 and July 2007, India had 3,900 fatal victims as a result of terrorism, more than any other country anywhere with the exception of Iraq and more than Afghanistan and Pakistan. But Mumbai, the country's commercial and industrial capital, the one that symbolizes the achievements of the new India, the city of Bollywood and the Birlas of the Ambanis and the Tatas has been the favorite objective. As Suketo Mehta, the author of a wonderful book, which uh, if you haven't seen, you should look up, uh, Mumbai, Maximum City, it has put it, just as cinema is a mass dream of the audience, Mumbai is a mass dream of the peoples of South Asia, and thus the ideal backdrop for mass terror on the world stage. The Mumbai attacks not only reflected the deadly use to which digital technology can be put to use by even small terrorist outfits, and why the age of globalization is also the age of terror, but also the key role of the media in reflecting, amplifying, and multiplying on many platforms, the activities of these terrorist groups. Some of you may have watched this, and it was most extraordinary. You had firemen traffic trying to put out the fire in the Taj Mahal Hotel, and cameramen and journalists would come to them, interrupting them in their work, trying to get some additional tidbits of information as to what was going on inside the hotel. Um, the terrorists would communicate with the television channels, and be interviewed and air their grievances and their questions about Kashmir and uh, other issues. So it was a most uh, extraordinary event. And uh, the most remarkable thing, it seems to me, is that far from abating after the global war on terror was declared after 9 11, terrorist actions, if anything, have increased in the early 21st century. While some argue that Al-Qaeda has been weakened, this is not the case for other outfits, like Lashkar e Toiba, which was behind the Mumbai attacks, or the Pakistani Taliban, which may or may not be associated <coughs> with Al-Qaeda, but whose agenda overlaps with the left. The main terror theater has thus shifted from Afghanistan in 2001 to Iraq in 2003, back to Afghanistan in 2007-8, and then to Pakistan in nuclear weapon state with all the attendant risks. So it has been said that nowadays we live in the age of terror. And we are too lucky to have with us today one of India's leading journalists and commentators, Mr. Saeed Nakhli, to address that topic and the roots of the Islamic terrorist movements. Mr. Nakhli is one of India's leading journalists and very prominent opinion leaders, both in the print and electronic media. He is also a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, a main think tank in New Delhi. During my four years in India, I religiously read his column in the Indian <coughs> Express to be informed as to what was happening in his other writings, and it's a privilege to interact with him on a number of occasions, and he 
graced us with his presence uh, at the Chilean Embassy for a number of events. In fact, shortly before my meeting there, I remember speaking with him, I don't know whether he remembers, and expressing how delighted we would be to have him visit CG. Well, it has finally come to happen. I leave with you, Mr. Said Nakvi. Friends, I'm sorry we got lost. We were told there was a construction site and we went around uh, about several times but we persisted because through the usual unreliable sources we had been told that the, at the end of the stock you will be gifted a barrel of Seagram's whiskey. <laughs> uh, I have, I believe a great deal of our time has already been exhausted in the quest for this location. So I will make myself a little brief. What is the time? And question and answer me, okay? Hmm. South Asia had the partition of the subcontinent not taken place in 1947, would at today's reckoning have something in the vicinity of 500 million Muslims. Had the partition not taken place in 1947 into India and Pakistan, there would have been 500 million Muslims on the subcontinent, which is more than all the Muslims beyond right up to the Maghreb. Definitely much more than the Arab world. Somehow we, when we think of Muslims, we Everywhere the focus is on the Middle East and, uh, and, and the Arabian Peninsula and that region. If you go to East Indonesia, Malaysia, the figure is astronomically high. The contact of Islam with India and with the West interestingly started in exactly the same year. In 711, Tariq ibn Ziyad with his cavalry crossed that small stretch of water from Morocco and set up his citadel in a thing called Jabal al Tariq. Jabal means rock. Tariq was his name. Through history, even names change, and that name today is Gibraltar. For 800 years in Andalusia, you had Muslim rule. It is very interesting that I am mentioning this fact because even today they are talking about Cordoba Center in, in Manhattan, very close to ground zero of 9-11.
I won't go into Cordoba. But it's interesting to remember that in that seven, eight hundred years of history, you had Duodenes, Al Rushd, you, you had Hindu, uh, Jewish, Christian thinkers getting together in the city square of Cordoba. You had uh, libraries, there was something like 57 libraries for a population of 400,000 in Cordoba alone, and 50 baths. But when the Inquisition began, you see, these are parts of history that I'm digressing, but I'm just complete the, the, the yarn. Uh, the Inquisitions were harsher on the Jews than on the Muslims. And many of them, of course, went over to, to Morocco. And to this day, those of you who have been to Jerusalem, you will find in many Sephardic Jewish homes the photograph of King Hassan of Morocco and in Jerusalem itself. And if you um, then many of them found refuge in the Ottoman Empire uh, elsewhere. So this was the Muslim contact. People do not know that for 400 years the Fatimids ruled in what is today Sicily. Palermo was the capital of the Fatimids for 400 years. Then if you come further, you have the, the Turks, and that is where the real clash began, which was St. Sophia, Aya Sophia Mosque, which it took the imagination of Ataturk, Mustafa Kamal Ataturk, when he forged this residual nation into a strong country, he said, look, that will hurt Europe. And he instantly transformed it into a museum and not a mosque. So you have a Sophia museum, the mosque. He said, that will be a constant and a perpetual hurt for Europe. 711 is also the year when an Arab uh, traveler, adventurer, um, uh, Bin Qasim, Muhammad Bin Qasim, made his probes into Sindh and this part of India. But the Indian story goes back further because if you can imagine your maps, imagine yourself, this is the Indian coast of Kerala, go further north, Mumbai, Karachi, and just across a small stretch of water separates the Indian coast from the Arabian Peninsula. So you had people in Dows, these were small boats, coming and going and trading in what was then called black gold. And black gold then was pepper and not oil. The teak in Kaaba, which is the Abrahamic house of worship where the Muslims circumambulate during Hajj, the teak in that part is all teak from Kerala. The first mosque was not built by invaders, it was built by a local chieftain in Kerala in a place called Kranganur, not far from Cochin. Do you have some idea of Kerala people here? Do you, have you had anyone here been to Kerala? Well, Kerala is an exquisite, it, it, it has many firsts to its credit. So the first mosque was established there. St. Thomas is supposed to have been to that part of the world. The Christianity was thriving in Kerala when it had not even reached Europe. 
So you have the Syrian Christian Church uh, affiliated to uh, Antioch and Syria. And you have Syrian Christians today uh, in Kerala as a very powerful, very powerful elite, in fact. Uh, this, the, as I said, the many firsts that Kerala has is that it was the first electorally elected uh, through the ballot box communist party that came to power in the 60s, which predates Allende by about a decade and more. People who came through the trading routes of the South, traders do not impose their culture. They want to sell goods. And so Islam in India, in the southern area, came through these traders who immediately were seeking penetration of the local cultures, adapted the cultures. So they had their mosques, but they had their culture, which made them totally indistinguishable one from the other. So and today, when I was the editor of a paper which also had its parish in, in Kerala, uh, we had uh, uh, the best speaker of Malayalam in that uh, assembly was Muhammad Koya, a Muslim. Now, Mohammed Koya, since I was the editor of the paper, invited me for dinner. Now, he knew very little English or no English and no Urdu or Hindi. I knew no Malayalam and no, uh, and therefore the communication between me and him was absolutely minimal. So here you had a Muslim editor of a major chain in South India being invited by the Muslim chief minister of a state, of a composite state of Hindus, predominantly, overwhelmingly Hindu, but the chief minister for a short spell was uh, Mohammed Koya, who had no communication. Once upon a time, when uh, Professor Hain, I think, was there, uh, in the Gujarat, were you there in the Gujarat's time now? In the Gujarat, uh, um, I, the, the three, there was a trilateral summit in Dhaka, Dhaka being the capital of Bangladesh. And since he was going there to meet the Prime Minister of Pakistan and the Prime Minister of Dhaka, he, would, he thought that in his entourage there should also be a notional Muslim because there are lots of Muslims in India. So he said, Said, why don't you come along? So Said Nafwi therefore got incorporated into that, that delegation. And there I turned up in. I have never in my life, there were six or seven Bengali journalists. Now these Bengali journalists were part and immediately as they landed, they were into Bhala Bhala Kikabar, which is the language of, uh, they were, in other words, the Bengali identity across the lines, much, much by, by a long shot, superseded the religious affiliation which my Prime Minister thought would be of some use to him in, in Bangladesh, but it wasn't, because I didn't know their language, I didn't know their foods, I didn't know their culture. The point I'm making is, that there is no such thing as a monolithic Islamic culture even in India, as it isn't globally. There is no such thing. The Muslims in Kerala speak Malayalam, they eat their food, which is different from mine. The Muslims from uh, my friend Charandasi, the consulate here, they, they are, speak another language, they live differently. In Bengal, they speak Bengali and they eat Bengali food and to eat that food which is called Ilish Mash, you have to be born of a Bengali mother to be able to eat it because you have to spit the bones out like a kitten. You can't. So there is a multicultural mosaic of Islam in India itself. However, 
they have been difficulties. And the difficulties, some of them are embedded in history. And I think this history gets accentuated during uh, the, 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 the British period. The British slept over the fact uh, for a while until in 19, 1857 they discovered that Hindus and Muslims have together under the auspices of the Mughal emperor in Delhi called Bahadur Shah Zafar fought what Indians call the first war of independence and which Churchill called uh, the mutiny. So therefore the mutiny and the first war of independence are one and the same thing depending at which end you are looking at that event. What happened after that particular? Uh, naturally, if I were ruling a place, if I were even running Seagram's company and there were two groups, I'd balance them. And I'd say, uh, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God's and play, and play one against the other sometimes. So this they did. A very interesting uh, revelation in, in that context. During the BJP, BJP is Hindu Nationalist Party of India. It's a shorthand because it doesn't describe anything. There are Hindu Nationalists in the Congress Party, there are Hindu Nationalists in the BJP. But BJP has been for shorthand, for communication, which is always imperfect. And these days, so imperfect that you don't get the story. It's called the Hindu Nationalist Party, BJP. They thought that they'd get hold of something substantial which they would pick up occasionally. And this was cow slaughter. They said the cow is holy and ever since these Muslims and others have shown up, all cows are getting slaughtered. And if cow slaughter can be made the single important issue, why? So they invited a scholar. Now this is the mistake that you make. You sometimes invite scholars and actually you needed motivated acts to do it. This scholar happened to be a Gandhian scholar. His name was Dharampal. Dharampal invited another friend called Manikam and together they began to research, which is not what the NDA government wanted. And the research produced a document <laughs> that document, I shall, just a little bit of it, I shall read out on page 9, is an interesting little edition. People don't know it, so therefore it's absolutely new. The clandestine support to the various cow protection movements in the country given by the British is a matter of record. But the clinching evidence that the British playing up the cow slaughter issue to widen the Hindu-Muslim divide has been provided by some extraordinary research done by the one that I've just mentioned to you. And the title of the book that he gives is British Origins of Cow Slaughter in India. Viceroy Lansdowne records the following minutes of a meeting in the consequence of a powerful anti-cow slaughter agitation. Now he's the viceroy. He records, and I quote, In Ireland, the home rule movement became really formidable from the moment Mr. Parnell's sagacity connected it with the agrarian question. So in India, the unrest and discontent will become infinitely more dangerous now that a common ground cow protection has been found upon which the educated Hindus and the ignorant masses can combine. Queen Victoria let the cat out of the bag. Being a very impulsive lady, she 
let the cat out of the bag. And she wrote a letter, <laughs> can you believe it, the Queen? She writes a letter in her own hand on December 18, 1893. She, she wrote, writes to the Viceroy, though the Mohammedan's cow killing is made the pretext for the agitation. It is, it is the agitation is in fact directed against us who kill far more cows for our army and our troops than the Mohammedans. You have managed the situation very well. These are quotes. So, I don't want to dwell very much on that. Partition happened. There was a tremendous amount of cultural commerce. You had poets writing about Lord Rama, you had poets writing about Krishna, Urdu, Muslim poets. You had singers who shared the, you know, if you went to the houses of Indian musicians today, three or four of them have died in the recent past, you will have their gurus and they were all Muslims, and you go to a Muslim singer's house and his guru would be nine times out of ten would be a Hindu. So therefore, there was a tremendous amount of cultural commerce between the two, which continues to this day. And Bollywood, which is our big, uh, you have the, you can't find a name other than a Khan who happens to be a hero. So you have Saif Khan and Shah Khan and this Khan and that Khan, for which again there's a sociological explanation. And that's not the reason why we are here today. This. Big cultural commerce is abruptly broken in 1947. In 1947, the Hindus who came over, migrated to India, were called refugees for the first part. It was a, it was a terrible, uh, the, I mean, it's Indian independence celebration is actually steeped in blood because the same day, thousands and millions of people crossing either way and getting killed in Witcher because people did not know what was happening. These people were called refugees, but for one, two, three, four, five years, over the years, they, they were assimilated into the Indian system. And in fact, two of these refugees ended up as becoming India's prime minister. One of them I mentioned in the Gujarat. The other one is Dr. Manmohan Singh, our present Prime Minister. On the Pakistani side, on the other hand, the refugee, you see, what, what happened during partition was that there were Muslim-dominated areas of Punjab, which the Muslim remained there, the Muslim dominated areas of what was known as Northwest Frontier Province, who in fact were opposed to partition, but they were kept there. And you had Bangladesh, or which is which is which was East Pakistan, where again, which proves my point that cultural affiliations would supersede religious, because you had country of Pakistan, East and West, the Pakistan, Punjab, Punjabi dominated uh, Pakistan army cracked down so heavily on the, on the uh, Bengalis in Dhaka as because they had dared to vote a government to power which was going to be sitting and be the Prime Minister in Islamabad ruling with a population here was stronger and Awami Lee had done very well. So the army cracked down and killed millions of people and we had 10 million refugees in India. India intervened and as a part of that result of that intervention, Bangladesh was created. So you see the Muslim monolith is already shattered. I've explained to you the Indian mosaic and here in Pakistan you have the Punjabi dominated wing and the Bengali dominated wing separate. So Islam as a cohesive uh, glue to keep a nation state together, it has already shown you that it simply doesn't work. 
the people who went to him to Pakistan, the funny thing of course is that with the creation of Bangladesh, the arithmetic on the subcontinent became very awkward. Why? Because the largest Muslim population in the world is Indonesia. The second largest Muslim population in the world happens to be in India. Now, if, if the second largest Muslim population in India lives happily with my friend Vijay Parshad and Sharandasi, and then how does the Pakistani author of the Pakistani state prove to themselves that they were right in having created that state? So, a series, a confrontation has to be created. And those confrontations, if they lead a little bit of tension between me and these two friends of mine over here, then it gives them, deludes their uh, thesis that the two-nation theory was right. Now, what is the two-nation theory? The two-nation theory was that Hindus and Muslims constitute two nations. Now you can see in the evidence that I have produced in these opening remarks that these are, it was blown to smithereens straight away. And more is happening. Two days ago, as I said, these people got assimilated, but in Pakistan they are called refugees. They were parked in the city of Karachi, which is the biggest and the most important port in all of South Asia, which includes Bombay. Why is it important? Because without Karachi, the ISAF, NATO, American efforts in Afghanistan simply cannot be sustained because that is the main port which provides the provisions which are then routed through the unstable territory of Balochistan in Pakistan through areas called Quetta Shora which is again very infested with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and, and um, uh, Kandahar which is another um, headquarter. So this, the troops, if they are to stay in, according to me, they are going to stay, they are not leaving in a hurry. This is all cock and bull that we hear that somehow the Americans are upping and leaving. And th that again is not my theme, but I will tell you that there is no intention of leaving. They cannot leave. They will not leave. Uh, yes, they will scale down. They will scale down. It will not be... The army, the combat units will be scaled down, but uh, according to estimates, there are 30 bases already in Afghanistan, of which six are so big, and I was there just the other day, that the masonry involved is sort of as big as this, and this building over here. So you are, and, uh, and then huge compounds. They, they are not temporary. And even when I was there, the buildings were being built in in uh, Mazar -e Sharif, North Afghanistan, for consulates. So why would consulates be built today when the Americans were upping and leaving? So they're not leaving. And they will need. So when they need supply lines, supply lines are critical. If supply lines are critical and they're going through Karachi, and through Balochistan, then the territory, they are going through Pakistani territory and therefore Pakistanis have virtually a blackmail control over the Americans. They can do and that is why they are hunting with the hound and running with the hare all the time in this war on terror and it is common knowledge even though all our newspapers have become very provincial and we don't get international news on the scale we should and our electronic media is excruciatingly biased so we do not know so but then you've got access to google and, and the internet 
find out and you will see that. Now, on the 7th, no, uh, Saturday, Friday, last Friday, an election was taking place in Karachi. Why was this election taking place in Karachi? Because it was a by-election. Why was a by-election necessary? Because the MQM, this is the refugees people, people who, Urdu-speaking people who had gone from parts of India, northern India largely, to and settled in Karachi, have a very strong party called the MQM, um, which means various things, but for you, shorthand is good enough. MQM. Now, MQM legislator called um, uh, Hamid Raza was assassinated in August. Why was he assassinated? Because through the years, since 1980, when this project of Islamization to wrest Afghanistan from the Soviet Union was set into motion and the subcontract was given to Pakistan exclusively, they created what is now today has emerged as your Taliban. This is all an idea between three groups of people, the United States of America, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan. The American interest was to somehow evict the Soviet Union from Afghanistan. But the three, two others had their own agenda. The Saudis were in it so that they could create a Wahhabi Yized, Arabized Islam in that area called Afghanistan, which would work as a bulwark against Shia Islam because the Islamic Revolution had taken place in Iran. That was the Saudi agenda. Meanwhile, Ziaul Haq had his agenda also. He said, look, so long as we keep talking about this common culture between India, the, the, what they call Ganga Jamni, the, the culture which was spawned by the two rivers of Ganga and Jamna. So long as we have this cultural affinity with India, so long as their songs are our songs, so long as their music is our music, their food is our food, their language is our language, so long as we are almost indistinguishable one from the other, we will remain insecure as a people. And the one way for him to remain in power was to Arabize the Pakistanis. So from the South Asian ethos, an Arabized Muslim was being artificially created as a spin-off from the effort in Afghanistan. These people, many of them were given and parked in Karachi as well. So Karachi, today a city of 18 to 20 million people, now has 4 to 5 million Pashtuns, stroke Taliban, because Pashtun and Taliban are interchangeable terms. Because every Taliban is a Pashtun, and every Pashtun is not a Taliban, but they are very clannish people, and if one comes and gets into the ghetto of Al Asif outside Karachi airport, he will be their guest forever. And as problems multiply, so therefore it was the conflict between the uh, Pathans or the Pashtuns and the Muhajirs or the refugees which resulted in the assassination of that leader in August which led to a conflict and 100 people were killed in retaliation. Now comes the by-election for that seat. In, that, in the election, the MQM got 
80,000 votes as opposed to 923 votes for the for the Pashtuns, stroke Taliban, stroke Pathan. This time they said no. Why? Because the ANP as a party is taking a drubbing in the Northwest Frontier province where their leader of Sandhyar Valley can't even enter Peshawar because the Taliban have become so powerful there. Or Talibanized Islam has become so powerful there. So they, we must find some base here. When they saw that they were going to lose this election also, they said this is going to be rigged by the MQM and they went around on a spree and about 40 people were killed day before, day before yesterday. Now this ethnic test, into this cauldron of ethnic sub-religious rivalries, you toss in some other confusing elements like Sipahe Sahaba, which says all Ahmadiyyas are apostates and they should be killed, or Lashkare Jangvi, all linked to the Taiba kind of groups, which is against the Shias. So you have this, these, this kind of puritanism tossed into the cauldron of Karachi, without which the Americans cannot sustain their effort in Afghanistan. This then leads to what is Karzai saying? What is his opposite number, Amrullah Saleh, saying in Afghanistan? What is the Taliban saying in Afghanistan? They are saying that the Americans are being had by the, uh, by the Pakistanis. The bases of trouble are there. Why don't they go and strike them? So when they send out the drones and kill one or two, the American, the Pakistanis say, hey, we are your allies. We will not be able to sustain ourselves. And please, for heaven's sake, you know, since we are cooperating with you in Afghanistan, let us be as far as the Indian side is concerned, because otherwise we simply, we must have some leeway. So, don't look at the terrorist bases that we have created inside Pakistan, only for Karachi, only for um, uh, Kashmir and parts of India. When Blackwell was the ambassador in Delhi, you were there then? Blackwell used to hold his dinners were sort of circular table. He then became advisor to uh, national security advisor to the two wishes here. He was the ambassador there. And the circular table, he would, uh, he said, now imagine I'm Henry Kissinger. And, and uh, it was a conversation like that. So the conversation began about uh, Pranam Mukherjee, now our finance minister, was sitting next to me. And I, say, and I said, look, you have gone and allied yourself with Pakistan in this war on terror. Whereas when we have been telling you for the last X number of years, since 89 particularly, that this is the source of terror, and you never seem to strike them. To the contrary, you've gone and hugged them as your allies in this war on terror. And his response was, Said, that is part a regional quarrel which has is embedded in history, which is being the Kashmir issue. What the Pakistanis have joined us for is the global war on terror. So this is where the story, this is the way the cookie is crumbling. <laughs> the Americans will not leave Afghanistan for a variety of reasons because 
Americans, big powers, once they enter areas of strategic importance, they don't vacate them for nothing. I have seen the 72 days of relentless bombing of Serbia and Kosovo, and the state of Kosovo has been created and recognized by many countries. But when they left, they have left behind the biggest base since Vietnam called Bond Steel abutting the, the edge of Kosovo with Macedonia. So big powers do not enter and say, oh, we've lost it and we go back. I mean, to this day, there's Guantanamo Bay somewhere I do. There is, the, wherever they are, the bases will remain, and in, in, in the case of Afghanistan, surveillance on Central Asia is elementary, surveillance on um, resurgent Russia, on the visit in China, on us, why not? And on, uh, uh, but, but, and this I can almost reveal a source. When you, if you get the Americans talking in Afghanistan, they say, you want us to absolutely lose control over the Pakistanis who have sent, who were behind those 19 people who flew three planes into various buildings. So, and they have the nuclear bomb. So the game, ladies and gentlemen, is this, that Afghanistan is, I don't know what the term for a machan is. In those days, we used to go for hunting. You, we created a machan where you sat and waited for the animal to come and then you... So Afghanistan is the machan and uh, the real story is, is the next door neighbor, which is Pakistan. They will never ever leave a nuclearized Pakistan, which is going the way I'm seeing Karachi go, which is going the way I see the Northwest Frontier Province go, they will not, and they will, so you, and as retaliation, terrorism will go. Over the years, yes, the incident in Bombay, and these things have been happening, but at the moment the Pakistanis are so preoccupied, they are, unfortunately, you see what India needs and what the subcontinent needs is a very strong, united, self-confident Pakistan. But Pakistan has this B in its body. Unless we are because we could not live with them. Yeah. We are because we could not live with them. And therefore, how do we uh, now suddenly say, oh, we are the same culture, same people. We doing and throwing begins and normalization is established. So the people want French. You send people from this side and they are the same. You see them here. You see them here, you get them together and you will find one totally indistinguishable from the other. But the establishment. And in Pakistan, you have an establishment in the army. You see, it's, it's a peculiar phenomenon of modern times that when the Soviet Union collapsed, lo and behold, we discovered that the Great Shred Army was actually a Russian army. When the Great Yugoslavia collapsed, we discovered that the Great Yugoslav Army was actually a Serb army. And when Pakistan, when the chips are down, we discover that actually the Pakistan army is the Punjabi army by and large with some, uh, some Pathan, Pashtun elements, uh, 10 to 20 percent in. But those 10 to 20 percent have been co-opted because they cocktailed with the Punjabi in Lahore. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the overall picture in which you might ask me questions as to where did I, where is that word terrorism which I have not used. I think I should use it if you have the questions.
was a very clear description of history, thank you. But I just was wondering, where does Iran fit into all this? Better? Iran. Iran fit into all this. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. If, if Karachi becomes totally unworkable, since they have already tried and explored the Soviet route, the Russian route, I'm sorry, the Russian route and it has not worked. And according to my evaluation, they, are, they will need supply lines. And if Karachi becomes ungovernable, I am in some distant future, the ports of Iran might begin to beckon. But even before that, let me tell you, among the interests that do not want the Americans to leave Afghanistan happens to be Iran. Why? Because if on account of its nuclear ambition, it is decided that Iran needs to be clobbered or Natanz taken out, Iranians have the capacity to retaliate while you have 150,000 troops here across the border in Afghanistan, across the border in Balochistan, across the border in uh, Iraq. But should, by some miracle, which is not happening, Americans up and leave and hit them from a distance, Iran loses the capacity to retaliate. So Iranians also have an interest in the, their rhetoric to the contrary notwithstanding they have an interest in the American stain. That is the Iranian dynamic. And in any case, let me tell you that you never know what contacts are on. You do not know. We did not know in 1986 when a Bible and a cake and, a, and all of this were delivered to uh, the leadership. Point Dexter was the national security advisor. Schulz was the Secretary of State, Weinberger was the Defense Secretary in Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, Reagan, was the, Reagan was the President. And they went, and you know what the deal was? This Islamic revolution struck a deal that they would receive arms from Israel to sustain their war against Iraq, and the money thereby would be sent to the Contras who were fighting the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. It was called the Iran Gate, it was called the Iran Contra Affair. So, and do you know with whom these people were talking? And Point Dexter is now public document. Point Dexter says we now have very high level contacts. And you know who the high level contact was? was the speaker of the Iranian Majlis, Hashemi Rafsanjani. That is the person they want to be in power again. And do you know who the president was? Ali Khamenei, who is now the spiritual leader of Iran. So there are wheels within wheels within wheels. It is not a straightforward story, and particularly not with the media the way it is. I mean, it is, a, unless you have your own sources, to study an issue, you will not know. So, you don't know what's going on. Next question. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I just want to, to ask about uh, uh, terrorist attacks and what is the main reason for it? Is it uh, more about uh, religious hatred or is it more about uh, political issues? Well, what do you Terrorist attack. You see, uses of Islam for political purposes. Terrorism is one such. Ever since I have been to Toronto, I'm not changing the subject, but I'm giving you. The first night, 
we, we are staying at Del, Delta Chelsea Hotel. We were having dinner, my wife and I. Suddenly, an almighty alarm went on. And we were asked to vacate the building. So while in the midst of my steaks and my uh, glass of wine, we got up and we went outside. And I found a very happy, merry, cheerful crowd, almost imagining as if that the meal had become more exciting. They got something to go home and talk about because no one took it seriously and they were all outside and the fire brigades came and then within five minutes it was announced, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the fire brigade tells us that the problem has been rectified. So we go back. And when we went back, the man came to my wife and said, Madam, would you like to have an extra dessert or a glass of wine? She said, why? He said, because we have wasted your time. So the liquor is on the house. I said, my God, the easiest way to have more liquor is to go and pull the little <laughs> sticks on that. And, and now, and mind you, next day, I was sitting in my room writing. And again, the alarm went oh Oh, please stand by in your rooms. So I said, whoever this terrorist is, is now gradually moving towards the Guardian way. What he will not kill, he will not uh, uh, bring down buildings, he will not uh, uh, commit murder, he will not do suicide bombings. All he will do is keep you unsettled. So that when you go out for a meal, there will be that siren and then the police will come until you get sick of it and you say for heaven's sake do something about that problem in the Middle East.